Hey everyone. Imagine I told you there was a technology that allowed windows to clean themselves. Science fiction, right? No, actually science fact. Uh, this technology has been available commercially for over a decade and I thought I'd have a go at uh, making some self-cleaning glass in my own shop. So let me tell you about it. If we look at an apparently clean microscope slide, we can see that water kind of beads up and runs off the surface. It doesn't sheet across the microscope slide fully. And this is because that even clean surfaces uh, have a small amount of grease or organic residue on them. This greasy residue is actually in the air and on the dirt that's floating in the air everywhere. So it has nothing to do with being in a clean or a dirty environment. Uh, even in very clean houses, you will end up with a very microscopic film of, of uh, grime on a window just because it coats the dust particles that are floating in the air. The water doesn't want to sheet across the glass because this grimy residue is hydrophobic, meaning that its molecules are nonpolar and the water molecules are polar and they don't want to mix. The whole oil and water don't mix thing. Here's a piece of glass that has been treated with this technology. As you can see, the water sheets across and doesn't have much tendency to beat up or form channels. The reason for this is that the coating on the glass is actually burned away all of that microscopic grimy layer and now the water can interact directly with the glass and it's actually quite hydrophilic, meaning that the glass's molecular structure attracts the water molecules. Here I'm going to apply some dirt to the glass by rubbing my finger on my skin and then on the glass. This will deposit a very small amount of oil on the glass. Now we can see that the water is back to beating up a bit. It doesn't flow across nearly as well. And so the way that the self-cleaning glass works is it uses energy from sunlight to uh, burn away some of that grease that's on the surface. So to simulate sunlight, I'm going to put the self-cleaning glass and then the untreated glass onto an ultraviolet light. This light simulates the amount of ultraviolet that we would get on a sunny day. After an hour or two, I take the slides off of the ultraviolet light and test them again with the water. The untreated slide still beads up and forms water channels, whereas the self-cleaning glass is now doing quite a bit better. It's maybe not quite as good as it was when I first took it out of the vacuum chamber, but it's definitely better, which shows that the ultraviolet light has actually caused something to happen with, that, with the self-cleaning action. One way to make self-cleaning glass is to put a coating of titanium dioxide, also called titania, on the outer surface, or the surface that you want to clean. And what happens here is the ultraviolet light hits this whole thing. This is a dirt particle on the surface, and the surface of the titanium dioxide is photocatalytic, meaning that it uses the energy from the ultraviolet light to actually break some of the molecular bonds in the dirt particle. So right at the interface where the dirt particle is touching the surface of the titanium dioxide, uh, we're actually going to, to burn away some of the hydrocarbons here. And then when it rains, the water will just push away this dirt particle. So the titanium dioxide doesn't actually have to break down this entire piece of dirt. All it has to do is break down the interface where the dirt is touching the surface. There's a couple different ways to deposit the titanium dioxide on glass. But the way I'm going to show today is via reactive sputtering. Reactive sputtering is a little bit of a twist on the regular procedure that I've talked about in other videos. So briefly, the idea is to slam argon molecules into a target material, and that slamming will break off little bits of the target. And if you have a, a substrate, the thing that you actually want to coat up here, all of those target molecules that have been broken off will eventually hit the substrate and coat it. With reactive sputtering, what we're going to do is add a gas to the chamber that chemically reacts with those target molecules as they're en route from the target up to the substrate. In this case, we want a coating of titanium dioxide. So what we're going to do is start with a piece of titanium metal and then add oxygen to the chamber so that we actually end up with titanium dioxide. As I've mentioned in the other sputtering videos, getting all of the process variables dialed in is quite difficult. So what I'm going to do is load the glass slide in, the untreated slide, into the sputter coater, and then add an aluminum shield. 
This way I can turn the whole uh, apparatus away from the sputter coater and adjust all the parameters until I get everything working properly. And then I can turn the whole thing around, essentially opening the shutter, so that I'll only coat the slide once the process is running smoothly. You might be wondering why don't we just start with a titanium dioxide disc and not worry about the reactive sputtering at all. And the answer is that sputtering titanium dioxide is a very slow process because it's a very hard material. It's actually much easier, much, much faster, in fact, to reactively sputter the titanium metal. To get started, we need to remove the titanium oxide coating that's uh, covering the target right now. This thing has been sitting in atmosphere for you know a few days or weeks even. And uh, if we just started off right away in the reactive setup, uh, we wouldn't actually get anywhere because that coating of titanium dioxide is very inert and it's covering up the target. So we'll start off with pure argon, and I have two flow meters that show how much argon and how much oxygen are going into the chamber. So initially I'm only going to turn up the argon side. The target diameter is about two inches, and we're running close to 100 watts. After a few minutes, the argon sputtering has broken away all the titanium oxide, and we are sputtering bare metal. We can tell because the color of the plasma changes too, so when the titanium is bare, the plasma color is greenish, bluish greenish. Also we can see that the th crystal thickness monitor is now registering titanium being deposited. In order to start reactively sputtering, we need to start adding oxygen to the chamber, and the amount that we add is very critical, and controlling it is pretty difficult. So if we add too much oxygen to the chamber, that skin of titanium oxide will form on the target and the sputtering process will slow down or almost stop. If there's too little oxygen in the chamber, then we aren't going to be reactively sputtering, we're just going to be getting fresh titanium metal onto the slide. To make matters even more difficult, the system has a lot of hysteresis. So starting from the titanium oxide setting, like let's say we're starting off with a high oxygen content, it's not possible to back down the oxygen concentration and get it into the working uh, regime. We actually have to go all the way down to fresh metal, basically shut off the oxygen, and then slowly ramp it up. The reason for this is that the titanium surface is very reactive, and so as it's being eroded away by the sputter process, it will soak up all the oxygen that's currently available in the chamber. and then. Uh, the sputtering will slow down because of that, because now it's been coated with titanium oxide. So it's a process that has some positive feedback to it, which is why we end up with this hysteresis effect. I'm working on getting some better equipment to control the oxygen content inside the chamber, but as it is now, what I'm doing is just looking at the thickness deposition gauge and then dialing the oxygen content manually every you know, 10 or 20 seconds to try to keep the process working. This doesn't work particularly well. Uh, the argon flow is fairly constant at about 20 standard cubic uh, centimeters a minute, and I'm using a new Pirani gauge to measure the vacuum level, which is about 10 or 20 millitor. After 10 or 20 minutes of fiddling with it, I, the thickness monitor registered at least 30 nanometers of titanium dioxide. In reality, it's a bit more than this because the thickness meter is farther away. I was mostly using the color of the plasma to figure out if the environment was oxidizing enough in the chamber. It would go from pale green to pink very quickly, uh, pink meaning that the oxygen was high enough to cause titanium dioxide to be formed. So you might be wondering if the process isn't too difficult, why aren't all windows coated like this? And the answer is it does increase cost, and you'd have to balance that against just you know manually washing your windows. And also, the uh, window behaves ecologically like an animal in that it takes solid carbon and essentially burns it and releases carbon dioxide. So there's been some concern that that's uh, you know, not the environmentally best thing to do. Whether the quantity is really significant or not, I, I don't know. Okay, see you next time. Bye.